Merry Christmas. Um, if you're guests with us this evening, uh, we're so glad that you're here and um, just want to uh, extend a welcome and say that uh, if you'd like to connect with us in any way, you can through that connect card um, in the seat in front of you and let us know anything that you want to communicate to us. Um, this evening, our hope is that you would have the opportunity to slow down and take a pause and just reflect on what Christmas is really about. There's a whole lot of great Christmas movies out there. I'm a big fan of a lot of them. Um, and pretty much all of them get Christmas wrong, <laughs> right? They're all talking about what is Christmas really all about. And every single time they get it wrong. Um, that's okay. We're going we're gonna to zero in tonight just from God's word uh, and look at what is this, what is Christmas really all about? Um, so if you have a Bible, I'm going to be looking at that passage in Luke chapter 2, and I'm going to be walking through that verse by verse. You can go ahead and get that out. If you don't have a Bible, that's perfectly fine. We'll have it on the screen for you to follow along, but I'm going to pray one more time before uh, I go any further. Father in heaven, God, thank you for the babies um, in the room and the children in the room. Lord, what a blessing they are. We love families, and we love this opportunity to, to be together uh, and, and to fix our gaze on the real meaning of Christmas and to worship you as a result. And I pray that that would be the result of tonight, that you would be honored and glorified and that Jesus would be lifted high. God, we thank you for what you did for us on Christmas Day 2,000 years ago. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's walk through this passage, and I'm going to... Um, here's, here's my goal. Uh, we've probably heard this story uh, many times. Many, most of us, we've heard this story many times. Uh, but I just want us to slowly think through it, verse by verse, and, and consider it, and meditate on it. And I think that that's going to actually produce fruit in, in our hearts. And then I'll give you a couple of different uh, takeaways from it before we, before we move on. So, starting in the first three verses, it says, In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. Um, so, Let's talk about these three verses, Caesar Augustus's census. Notice that Luke, who is a historian, who, who wrote this gospel account, um, places the birth of Jesus in a particular point in history. Um, and it's, it happens to be when Caesar Augustus uh, decrees that there is this registration, this census that in order for people to have, you know, they can keep track of people for tax purposes. Um, and so I don't know if some of you might be new to church, but, um, but Christianity is a historical religion. It is based on historical events. It is a religion that is based upon truth. And so the first thing that I think that we need to just pause and consider is the fact that this this Christmas story is a story that is historical. Um, the story of, his, of Jesus' birth begins with this royal edict from Caesar. Caesar Augustus was the title for Caesar Gaius Octavian, and the name Caesar Augustus, the title Caesar Augustus, means supreme ruler. It's interesting, I was doing a little research about this guy, and I mean, you can look up an image of, multiple images of, uh, of marble carvings of this guy. You can see what this man looked like. It's wild to think that um, I, we can look at the guy that made this decree that brought all of this, that kind of started the ball rolling for all of this, and just wild. Um, he was the... He was the guy who succeeded Julius Caesar. So Julius Caesar was the ruler over the Republic of Rome. And then this guy 
um, took over, and it, Julius Caesar was his uncle. Anyway, he took over, and then he founded the, uh, the Roman Empire. But here's the point that Luke wants us to, to see, and that is that this famous historical character who saw himself as the supreme ruler was really a pawn of God's providence, to borrow a phrase from Charles Swindoll. And, and what I mean by that is this. God had prophesied more than 700 years earlier that the Messiah would be born in the little town of Bethlehem. We, we read that scripture from uh, just a few minutes ago. But Mary and Joseph lived a long way from Bethlehem. They lived in Galilee in a little town called Nazareth. And so in order to fulfill this prophecy, God, who is sovereign over world powers, used the man who thought that he was the supreme ruler to move little Mary and little Joseph from, from their little hometown in Nazareth down to Bethlehem. He, God, used the most powerful nation on earth to move people all over the place so that they could be registered so that little Joseph and little Mary could be where they needed to be in order for God's 700-year-old prophecy to come to pass. Luke is intentional in pointing to this juxtaposition between the massive political power of the kingdom of Rome, which enacts worldwide decrees, and God's unexpected king and his unexpected kingdom. Jesus is the beginning of a new humanity. And he slips into the world quietly in a nowhere town almost entirely unnoticed. So, let's look at the next section, verses 4 through 5. Joseph and Mary and their travels to Bethlehem. It says, verse 4, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary his betrothed, who was with child. Now, Joseph had no choice in this matter. He had to do this. Um, he had to go to Bethlehem in, in Israel in, in order to be registered um, because in Israel they were registered according to tribes and clans. And Joseph was an ancestor of King David. And King David was born in Bethlehem. And so... Joseph had to make this trip to uh, Bethlehem in order to be registered there. But Mary didn't have to go. And that's the interesting thing for us to think about here, is that she chooses to go. And we don't know the, the reason why. Um, maybe Joseph said to her, I don't want to be gone while the baby comes, and I don't know when I'll be back. Or, or and this is just an interesting thought for us to think about, maybe they knew the prophecy. It's possible because for, for nine months now, they, they have been waiting on this baby to be born. And, and uh, Gabriel had told them that this was going to be the Son of God, the Messiah, right? And so if, if I'm Mary and Joseph, I'm probably going to start doing as much research as I can to find out what have the Scriptures said about this coming Messiah. So, you know, it's just a thought. We don't know. But maybe they knew the prophecy in Micah 5, 2, but you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Whatever the reason, Mary does go with Joseph. And the trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem was something between 70 and 90 miles, depending on the roads, and it would have been by foot or possibly by donkey. And it was at least a four-day journey. And we might look at that and think, how in the world does a woman who's nine months pregnant make that journey? Well, um, they were a walking people back then. And so it wasn't like Mary had been sitting around uh, on the couch waiting until this point and then got up and did a four-mile, I mean, a four-day hike, right? Uh, she would have been walking day in and day out. And so even if she made that walk, um, it would not have been unusual for her. This was 
This kind of trip was ordinary life for first century Jews. Um, Jesus would grow up going to Jerusalem every year at Passover, making this trip. And Bethlehem is just, just a little ways past Jerusalem. So it's the same journey, only a little bit further. Um, and it said, you may have noticed that they went up from Galilee. We think of up as being going north, but, but actually they went south and, and they went up because there was a, an in, a sharp increase in, in elevation. All right, so the nativity scene. Let's look at verses 6 through 7. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. So what's going on here? Well, Bethlehem was overrun with people who were registering for the census. And so there was no available room in the town, in the, in the inn in the town, which would have probably only had a handful of rooms. And the thing that's, I think, interesting for us to consider about this is that this great big sovereign God who was willing and capable of moving the, whole, the, the Roman Empire in order to bring this about could have easily... Um, provided a room for Jesus to be born in. And so the fact that Jesus was, was born in a stable was God's design. It was God's will. This was the plan all along, that God, would, that Jesus would be born in the most humble of circumstances. Um, 2 Corinthians 8 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And here's the thing that I want us to see, that is that Jesus' entire life was one of sacrifice. It's not like he lived this posh, easy life until the last week, you know, uh, leading up to the cross. His entire life was one of sacrifice. He left heaven an unimaginable glory to come to earth, to be born in a little nowhere town among animals. Jesus' um, road to the cross, in other words, began on day one. It says that he was placed in a manger, which is just an old English word for an animal trough. And the point that we're supposed to see is that Um, Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, spent his first night on earth, not in a palace, but in an animal stall. And his bed is not a soft bed of feathers that's meant for a king, but a feeding trough. Early church tradition um, says that he was born in a cave that this uh, stable would have been carved out into the limestone in Bethlehem. But either way, he spends his first night in the most humble of circumstances. Let's look at verse 8. It says, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Shepherds were um, at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. Their job involved sleeping outside, and caring for dirty animals. They were the the seemingly unimportant people in society. Yet God looked at them and He chose them out of all the people in the world to bring this incredible angelic announcement to. Um, Why did God choose the shepherds? Why them? Of all the people... Uh, Why did he choose the shepherds to be the privileged few to receive this world-changing news from angels? And the most likely um, answer to that is that they were the ones who were the most likely to receive it. Because let's think about it for just a minute. Um, He could have made this announcement to King Herod, right? Maybe, Maybe a king should hear about this. But we know from reading on in the story that King Herod, when he found out, about Jesus' birth, he sought to kill Jesus. Okay, so maybe he could have sent these angels to the religious leaders 
of the day and told them that a Messiah had come. But we know from reading on in the story that when they find out about Jesus, they're threatened by him and they also seek to destroy him. But the little lowly shepherds were excited to hear of the birth of a Savior for their people. It says in verse 9, And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. So an angel shows up, one at first, and then more a little bit later. And, um, you know, I was thinking about all the pictures in my head that I've grown up with um, about this scene. In the Bible, it never says that angels have wings. I've, I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot of paintings and things where angels are flying above them, right? Um, the Bible does say that the seraphim that, that are surrounding the throne, crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, that they have wings. But it never, it never explicitly says that angels have wings. Instead, what you see when an angel pops into a story in the Bible is that oftentimes they kind of veil their glory and people think that it's a man. And and then there are other times where they they don't veil their glory, they let it be seen and people are terrified and fall down in front of them in fear, right? And so um, Psalm chapter 8 says that, that humans are a little bit lower than the angels in glory and honor. Um, so these are, these are glorious beings that look a lot like a human. And so this angel appears. I picture in my mind that it's evening time, right? I picture in my mind that these shepherds have already kind of sat down. Maybe the, the sheep are sleeping, who knows. And they've already sat down or they're leaning against a rock or a tree or something like that. And then all of a sudden, boom, there's a man that's glowing <laughs> standing in front of them. Um, It says the glory of the Lord shone around them. And we don't know. Maybe the glory of the Lord was shining down like a beam of light. But here's what I I picture here is, you know, Gabriel says to Zechariah, I stand in the presence of God. I think that the glory that shone all around was the glory from being in the presence of God. Some of you might remember the story of Moses when he would speak to God face to face. What happened to him? What happened to his face? It starts to glow, right? Just from being in the presence of God. I think the glory that was shining around was the glory of God coming off of this angelic messenger that stands in the presence of God. Um, When people see angels, they are tempted to worship them. In Revelation 22, 9, This happens to John. He sees an angel, he falls down before it, but the angel says, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And then we get to verses 10 and 11. Um, And I want to come back to those in just a minute. Before we get to those verses, I want to give you a couple of thoughts on these first nine verses. Verses. Just two takeaways. First takeaway is this. Recognize that this is a surprising story for the birth of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that it took place this way, Jesus coming to earth in the in the most humble means imaginable, very intentionally. Because God's kingdom is an upside-down, surprising kind of kingdom. Remember Micah 5, 2. From Bethlehem shall come come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. From Bethlehem, a surprising place, a very small, nowhere town. But he is one who is to be ruler in Israel. This baby is more than just a cute, sweet little boy. He is a Savior who is Christ the Lord. In other words, and this is the part that I don't want you to miss, this is the beginning of a darkness-destroying kingdom of light that is spreading in the midst of this broken world, the way that leaven spreads through dough. 
it wouldn't be long before the kings and rulers of this world would recognize the threat that Jesus posed on their agenda and would try to snuff him out. And the same things are happening today. Those who want to be their own king don't want Jesus' lordship challenging their agenda. And they'll stop at nothing to try and quench his ever-spreading kingdom, but they cannot stop this unconquerable ruler of the cosmos. That's the first takeaway that I want you to see. When, when Jesus comes back, he isn't coming back um, hidden. He's not sneaking into a little nowhere town. He's coming back with his angels in power and glory. And it says that all the earth will see him and they will tremble. The second takeaway is this. Don't let your pride blind you to the inexpressible gift being offered to you. This high and holy king comes to the little and the lowly. The sovereign God moves mountains and world-conquering kingdoms like Rome in order to accomplish His will with the lives of little nobodies like Mary and Joseph and me and you. The good news of this kingdom doesn't click with the proud of heart. But for those like the shepherds who know themselves as little and lowly, this high and holy God will shine light into your heart and help you to see the truth and beauty of the gospel. So what do we do with Christmas? That brings us back to verses 10 and 11. Look at those with me. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. These two verses tell us that Christmas is the foundation for the whole Christian faith. Christmas is good news of great joy because without Christmas we have no Savior and therefore no salvation. Jesus could not have died on the cross if He didn't have a body. God became a man so that He could die as a man for men. When Jesus came into the world that night in Bethlehem, He came as the representative of a new humanity. Adam, our first representative of humanity, was tempted and sinned, which brought separation from God and death, both to Adam and to all his descendants. But Jesus, and Paul calls him the new Adam, was tempted and he never sinned. He came and he passed every test, conquering Satan. He bound up the strong man and plundered his house, freeing people from sin, sickness, and the oppression of the devil. And then, as our new representative before God, Jesus went to the cross in our place. And He offered up His perfect life as a substitute for ours. He died for our sins. His very first night on earth foreshadowed that this was His entire purpose for coming. Mary wrapped Him in bands of cloth, which foreshadowed the day of His death when He would again be wrapped, this time in a shroud in preparation for his burial. Mary lays her bound baby in a manger, foreshadowing the day that his bound body would be laid in a tomb cut out of the rock. But Jesus didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose from death and defeated sin and the darkness that tried to snuff him out. I believe that even Jesus' resurrection is foreshadowed in his birth when he's referred to here as Mary's firstborn son. Mary's firstborn son meant more than just the fact that he was the first one um, in line. It meant that he was the heir of Joseph's house. This title given to Jesus at his birth was pointing to his risen status as firstborn of all creation. Romans 8, 29, Colossians 1, 15. This baby was not just the heir of Joseph's house, but the heir of the whole world and the heir of the new creation and of his Father's kingdom. The good news for you and for me is that the Son of God became a man not to come and to crush those in rebellion against him, but to be crushed for them. This high and holy God has mercy on the little and the lowly. This good news is for anyone humble enough to receive it. If you're willing to see yourself rightly as someone who is in need of a Savior, 
that you needed Jesus to die in your place to, for the penalty of your sins, then you can be saved. But how does that happen? The Bible says that we turn from our sins to God in faith. That we believe this good news about Jesus Christ, His Son. That we confess our sins to God in prayer and cry out to Him to forgive us and to save us. And the Bible says in Romans, 9, or Romans 10, 9-10, through 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So what do we do with Christmas? Believe it humbly. Rejoice because of it and worship the one who brought it all to pass. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for the gift of Jesus, that you did not withhold your only son, whom you loved, but you sent him to become a man, to live the perfect life, to die a brutal death in our place, and to be raised from the dead on the third day. Lord, thank you for the gift of the gospel. I pray that every person in this room would be granted the gift of faith to believe it tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.